So welcome back. And uh, so we're going to continue our uh, education. Paul was at a, at a high level of the economy. Our next speaker is going to get us down into some uh, more micro topics, uh, although they are of very general interest. So Phil Simon is a professor at Arizona State University. And for those of you who were uh, uh, at the cocktail party, I, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. But uh, uh, ASU, uh, I was listening to uh, Dr. Crow talk recently. And Dr. Crow is the, the uh, president of ASU. Uh, but ASU is the largest university in the United States. And for the last three years, it's won uh, the award of being the most innovative university of the United States by uh, uh, by a, a business news world report or whatever, I, I, I'm having a mental block here. But um, and um, uh, they only had the award for three years, and ASU has won it all three years. So that gives you an idea. It's U.S. News and World Report, but that, that gives you an idea of how uh, incredible a place it is. And um, so when we thought about doing this conference, we really wanted to do it in concert with ASU to be able to deliver uh, to you some education that might be again meaningful for you over the next year or two. Um, so Phil Simon will come up and talk to us. Uh, he's written eight management books. Uh, he has uh, been uh, on uh, CNN, ABC, NBC, CNBC, Business Week, Huffington Post. Um, and what he's going to talk about is uh, analytics, systems design, and business intelligence, which is such a key thing. If you talk to people uh, over the last year, uh, business intelligence and how people evaluate their businesses is key. Uh, he's from uh, Carnegie Mellon University with a uh, Masters from Cornell, so please uh, welcome Phil. Hello, Store Capital. Or oh, switched over here. Okay, I'm Phil. Hello. A bit about me. Why should you be listening to me? As I said, I speak at ASU. I'm a lecturer. Written eight books. I am. Um, like to think of myself as at the intersection of business data, technology, and people. And today I'm going to talk about building a culture of analytics. A bit of a warning. I'm a huge fan of Breaking, Fa Breaking Bad. Any fans out there? Show hands. Okay. So caution, there are more than a few pop culture references in this one. If you would, turn your phones to mute. And I'll talk today primarily about two of my books, The Visual Organization and my most recent one, Analytics the Agile Way. Here's my plan of attack going to speak for 27 minutes-ish, and then I'll take a few questions. What will you learn today? What is a culture of analytics? Why is building one so essential today? Which companies have already built one? How can I build one or a better one for my organization? And what does this all mean for the future? I want to start with a theory I have of management. I have a bit of a bone to pick with management consultants who say in a very facile way it's all about execution. Really? What if you're executing on the wrong strategy? What if it's 1999 and you're Yahoo and you think the future's order about portals and not search? Whoops. What if you're in the beeper business? That ship has already sailed. Well, so you have execution. Peter Drucker, who's a reasonably intelligent management guru, said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I'd argue that culture actually beats strategy, which beats execution. Culture matters. So what are we talking about here? Just what is a culture of analytics anyway? I've Googled this quite a bit, and he didn't actually say it, but it sounds like something Churchill will say. Success begins with a common understanding of terms. So what is a culture of analytics? Well, I'd argue that it's one in which most, not all, decisions rely upon data, modeling, experiments, and analysis. Now, this doesn't mean everything. Before she worked at Yahoo as the CEO, Marissa Meyer drove people crazy at Google, insisting that designers split test or A-B test 37 shades of blue. So not everything needs to be tested, but generally speaking, I will bet any day of the week and twice on Sunday on companies that have embraced analytics over those that haven't. One quick note here, think continuum, not binary. In other words, this is not an either or situation. You can think of degrees, right? Google does more with data and analytics now than what it did in 1998, ditto for Netflix. So why is this stuff important, right? Hasn't analytics always been important as a practice, right? Why is it important now? Well, I'd argue that the culture of analytics allows organizations to make better decisions than if they simply rely upon gut feel. We see this happening in advertising all the time with the rise of programmatic advertising. The Don Drapers of the world are going away and being replaced by algorithms that can make effective decisions much quicker than people can. 
and analytics allow organizations to answer the following questions. How are we really doing? What types of problems are on the horizon? Are we on track? Are we paying attention to the right things? Are we experimenting enough? Can we work smarter, and if so, how? These are all important questions that analytics can help us answer. So why is this stuff more important than ever, right? Our existential question. Well, to answer that, I'd like to take a step back there and take a look at the contemporary business landscape. Does anyone doubt that the era of big data has arrived? When I was researching my new book, Analytics the Agile Way, came across a really interesting tidbit. In July 29th of 2016, the five most valuable companies in the world, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, all except Apple, use data to do things in really interesting ways. Apple brands itself as a premium product, 35% project profit margins. They don't need to be monetizing user data, but they are the exception that proved the rule. So big data is here, and we are adopting new technologies faster than ever. But don't believe me, let's look at the data. W. Edwards Deming is an American professor and engineer and researcher, and he's got one of my all-time favorite quotes, in God we trust, all of us bring data. A couple years ago, The Economist looked at the trends of the last 150 years to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. They wanted to see the rate at which companies adopted new technologies, or better yet, the rate in which households adopted technologies. So they looked at different technologies over time and determined how long it took a quarter of the American population, households, to adopt new technologies. Electricity launched in 1873, any guesses on how long it took to reach a quarter of the American population? 46 years. Telephone launched in 1876. Any guesses? No? 35 years. Radio, 1897. 31 years. Does anyone see a trend here? Good, because it's about to get a lot faster. TV launched in 1926. Only took 26 years. The personal computer launched in 1975, 16 years. The mobile phone, back when they were clunky, car phones the size of shoes, launched in 1983, 13 years. And finally, the web launched in 1991, seven years. So things are picking up, things are accelerating. And again, don't just believe me. Does anyone know who Ray Kurzweil is? He's a futurist. He's made some crazy predictions in the past. Like, for example, by 1985, he predicted in 1980, I believe, that a got my years a bit off, but that a computer would be the world's best chess player. He was wrong. It happened a year earlier than he thought. And he believes that technological change is exponential, not linear. This is not just a matter of semantics. If you look over time, if something is increasing and doubling a little bit, a little bit, boom, before you know it, something is huge. It's a lot faster than linear change. In other words, the long term has never been shorter, but again, don't believe me. John Chambers used to be CEO of Cisco Systems. And about two and a half years ago, before he retired, he gave a speech in which he predicted that within 10 years, 40% of attendees at a conference would not have their business ex exist in a meaningful way. So if you're not scared, you should be. So in this rapidly changing world, I would argue that developing a culture of analytics is a necessity, not a diamond. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get the married guys in trouble here. But a diamond is not a necessity. You can live without one. Water, not so much. Okay. Now this begs the question, who's actually doing this? Right? And before I get to that, I want to propose another simple theory of the world. Right? Three groups of people, three types of companies. Organizations that get it, spend some time talking about these. Organizations that don't get it, but want to get it. And then organizations that don't get it and don't want to get it. I do not have a lot of faith that the companies in the third group will be around for very much longer. So we know in this era of big data, there are clear winners and losers, right? Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, doing unbelievable things with their data. And I'm not talking about simply making movie recommendations. In fact, some of these companies' entire business models are based on this. Everyone here, I imagine, has a cell phone with a contract from T-Mobile, uh, Sprint, Verizon for two years. Right? If you don't like it, you want to break your contract, you have to pay a fee, typically $350. What happens if Netflix doesn't serve up relevant information? Boom, cancel. Right? So these companies' business models, in many instances, are based on being able to provide relevant information. If you find that Google isn't providing relevant searches, right, there are other search engines besides Google, despite the fact that the company runs about two-thirds of all searches in the United States. 
So Amazon can go way beyond making simple predictions, right? If I like Breaking Bad, and I do, it's not a big stretch for me to like Better Call Saul, which is the prequel, or The Walking Dead, or other gritty shows like that. But Amazon can do much, much, much more. Did anyone see on Charlie Rose, CBS um, 60 Minutes a couple years ago, Jeff Bezos talking about Amazon drone delivery, Prime Air, anyone catch that? My favorite part of that interview is that when Rose asked him, is this even possible, Bezos said yes, because I think it was 62% of products at Amazon weigh under five pounds. The way that Amazon knows its business is absolutely amazing. And in 2014, the company filed a patent for, and I'm not making this up, anticipatory commerce. This is a fancy way of saying that Amazon's going to know what you want to buy before you actually buy it. How can it do same day delivery for something if you live in San Diego and the product is in New York? Not going to happen. So Amazon can predict what people are going to buy and when, and this is an enormous advantage. Anyone here on Amazon Prime for video? If you think about it, Amazon not only knows what kind of movies you like, but what kind of music. And maybe there are relationships there that even Netflix can't possibly figure out. Few companies are doing more when it comes to data than Amazon and Netflix. And Netflix, I actually spent a great deal of time studying when I was working on my sixth book, The Visual Organization. The things that Netflix does are absolutely astonishing. They just crushed their quarterly numbers and added another 8 million subscribers. $120 billion market cap. And yes, just like Amazon, they can make recommendations based on what you like. But how do you keep this going, right? All sorts of variables go into the Netflix algorithm. So I thought we'd take a look a little at that, right? Why are they so successful? Well, in fact, there are many reasons. And I'd argue that first and foremost is plain old dumb luck. Does anyone know who John Antico Antioco is? I didn't think so. He was the CEO of Blockbuster. And around 2000, when the dot-com boom was crashing, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix for a reported $50 million. And Antioco and Blockbuster senior reps said, you know what, we see the future, people are always going to want to go to Blockbuster, right? They're not going to want their DVDs delivered, they're not going to stream them, okay? Who here has been to a Blockbuster lately? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone know how many Blockbusters are actually left in the United States? Six. One's in Alaska. Uh, there, some are in places in which they actually don't get great, great broadband. And in fact, Netflix doesn't have the ability to stream all of its movies. But Netflix has effectively made Blockbuster go bye-bye. So it starts off with luck. But Netflix uses technology in ways that absolutely astonish me. I spoke at Netflix headquarters, and I don't take selfies often. But when I saw this award in the lobby, I said, that's pretty cool. I thought it was an Emmy for Kevin Spacey winning for House of Cards, right? was not. Netflix has actually won a technology Emmy. I didn't know that such a thing exists, but when I spoke at Netflix, it became obvious to me that all employees understand the importance of data. And I'll give you a quick example of that in a little bit. Researching Netflix for the book, I came across a three-part data credo. The first is this. Data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. As someone who spent about a decade consulting, I could tell you that in many organizations, data is hidden or confidential, or at least hard to get at by default. Now look, no one's saying here that Netflix is anarchy. It doesn't mean that everyone knows confidential information about salaries, HR, health. But at Netflix, they start with the assumption that people could benefit from seeing this data and work backwards from there. Second part of the creda, the longer that you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. Right? Given that we're living in an age of increased change, accelerating change, does anyone doubt that? The way I kind of teach it to my students is some data is like milk. It'll expire if you wait too long. And the third and potentially most interesting piece is that whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. When I was research researching my book on data visualization, I discovered that neurologists found data is anywhere from 60 to 60,000 times faster to understand if you're looking at it in a visual way, right? as opposed to just looking at raw data. Walk around the headquarters of Netflix in the lobby, and you will see, I'm not making this up, data visualizations on the wall. But I'm not just talking about static visualizations. I'm talking about interactive ones. Employees can effectively have conversations with their data and find new patterns, basically embraced with data discovery. Now, this is a three-part credo, right? I wondered if it was sort of facile, right? Our people are our most valuable resources, our customers, right? et cetera, et cetera. Well, here's a case in point that is not the case at Netflix. 
This is Ted Sarandos. He is the head of content at Netflix. And I was watching in 2013 a video interview with, Sir, um, with um, Sarandos and Corey Johnson of Bloomberg News. And Netflix spent $100 million on the first season of House of Cards without even a pilot. Right? They just knew they had the information to market that effectively. So David Fincher directed the first episode. He also di uh, directed Fight Club, but we're not supposed to talk about that. They knew that they could market that specifically to people who liked Fincher and Fight Club, but then people who liked movies with Robin Wright, they could market it a different way. So Johnson asked Sarandos, aren't you afraid that you're going to spend $100 million on a series and people will pay eight or nine bucks a month on Netflix, binge the entire 13 episodes and quit. Legitimate question, right? Netflix isn't going to recoup its investment that way. Sarandos didn't bat an eye. He said, not really. Only roughly 20,000 of our customers did that. Now, to be fair, 20,000 is a big customer. I'd wager that most people don't work for companies that have that many customers, but 20,000 on top of 50 or 60 million at the time is a rounding error. Netflix knows its customers astonishingly well. Case in point, they understood that 50,000 people watched season three of Breaking Bad in its entirety the day before season four premiered. Right? Do you know your customers that well? Probably not. Right? Now, Netflix is an enormous uh, user of data. In fact, when I spoke at Netflix headquarters to a group a little bit larger than this one, I made a mistake. I said that Netflix was responsible for one-fifth of all U.S. nighttime internet traffic. I was wrong. Anyone know the number? It was a third, and it's actually gone up to 37%. A single person at Netflix didn't correct me. Probably 80% of the people in the audience said, in unison, a third. I'm actually glad that I made the mistake because it underscores how important data is to Netflix and not just at senior levels. But even though Netflix gobbles up a bunch of data, it is always hungry for more. A great other tidbit about Netflix, the company routinely purchases third-party data and metadata from firms like Nielsen. It wants to understand its customers better. Remember, people aren't locked into a two-year contract. They pay as long as the content is relevant for them. And even better, Netflix pays people to watch movies. I'm not making that up. Why would they do that? Because computers and algorithms can only get you so far. Right? Algorithms cannot understand how suspenseful a movie is or how funny it is. So at Netflix, they don't pay you to watch movies and go, what do you think? They actually train you on how to evaluate movies so you can do so in a more systematic way. In other words, people can do what algorithms and artificial intelligence cannot yet, and Netflix is willing to pay for the privilege. And with that information, the company can create 77,000 different subgenres of movies. Forget drama, action, comedy, documentary. Some of these will blow your mind. They actually exist. Dark, suspenseful sci-fi horror movies, gritty, suspenseful revenge westerns, romantic Indian comedy dramas, uh, crime, dra crime dramas, excuse me, evil kid horror movies, visually striking goofy action and adventure, and violent, suspenseful action and adventure from the 80s. These are just some of Netflix's 77,000 different subgenres of movies because no two people evidently are alike. So Netflix is wicked smart, to quote from Goodwill Hunting. It knows what its subscribers are watching, when its subscribers are watching, the devices on which its subscribers watch, and when they pause and hit play, right? Because certain people might respond better to content that starts with action in the beginning, like, oh, I don't know, the first episode of Breaking Bad. Other people might like more of a slow burn. So what do these companies have in common? Well, many things. And this is Reed Hastings, CEO and co-founder of Netflix. When he started the company back in 1997, he called it Netflix, even though if you're of a certain age like I am, you remember how horrible it was watching movies over the internet back then. There was a lot of buffering. He knew that eventually broadband would catch up and people would be able to watch movies on any sort of device. And eventually the DVD by mail business goes away. So it certainly starts at the top. But as I learned at Netflix, all employees need to be numerate, right? Most of us wouldn't hire employees who are illiterate, right? Can't read, can't write. At Netflix and other companies like Amazon, you need to actually be numerate. That doesn't mean that everyone is a data scientist, but I imagine a future in which people who aren't good at numbers are gonna be tougher to place inside the organization. They are willing to question existing assumptions and act on them quickly. This is not just a hollow 
Example here, they bake proficiency and data into everything, including hiring, a traditionally fuzzy process. One of my favorite stories from my new book is that Google threw out GPA for programmers, right? Because it did not correlate with long-term success. If you've got a 2.3 GPA at, in college and you're good at programming, Google will hire you. That doesn't mean that it's true across the board, but Google was willing to question a long-standing, and if you think about it, totally logical assumption. Right? Doesn't GPA correlate with a success? Well, not always and not exactly. And this begs the question, how do we do this? Lessons from the visual organization. First up, build interactive data visualization tools. Does anyone here have a Tableau license or monkey around with it? Okay. You can go nuts with Tableau, asking and answering individual questions. And if you think you need to be a big company to do it, think again. As an honors project, I gave my students at ASU my professor evaluations, and I said, have at it. I want you to create a visual that lets me find out where I'm doing well and where I'm not, which questions, which classes. Do I teach my analytics class better than I teach my system design class? Do I teach better in the fall than the spring, in the morning versus the afternoon? I want to know how I can improve, and I could spend an hour on my site playing around with this tool. Encourage data discovery and exploration. There is so much data out there, the notion that you need to have a report that contains every conceivable answer is downright insane. Let people play around, let people discover what's going on. Netflix does this not only with consumer tools to see who's watching what, but they do it extensively with their DevOps team. Their IT folks are constantly taking a look at what's going on in their network so they can prevent outages, right? These companies reject the notion that IT is the, is the primary report builder. This drove me crazy back in my client days. I would want information from a system and I couldn't get it, so I'd submit a request and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, a month later, I got what I wanted. The world moves too fast these days. Right? These companies find and integrate new sources of information. Again, Netflix purchases information, right? Even though they consume quite a bit of it. Netflix is constantly tweaking, I'm sorry, Google is constantly tweaking its algorithm. Amazon is constantly noodling with things. And in fact, getting rid of data, that doesn't make sense. Google, Amazon, fake product reviews. The company, even though it's got all this data and technology, can't figure out how to stop people from leaving fake reviews. And according to eMarketer, something like 80% of people look at reviews before making a purchase. Sites like Fiverr let people make five bucks for pasting in a review. Well, what happens if you have a bunch of reviews that don't make any sense? Are you going to trust Amazon as much? So these companies are very much protecting their assets. They also do not view analytics as one-time projects. I hate the phrase big data projects. Are you ever finished analyzing data? Or is it ever done? I would argue no. Even from a marketing point of view, people didn't take Pinterest very seriously when it started. Now, if you're in marketing and you're not paying attention to Pinterest, look out, the engagement numbers are off the chart. So they eschew this set it and forget it mentality. They understand that things need to change. Google's constantly tweaking its algorithm. If your website is not responsive, you go lower. And finally, you don't go from zero to Google overnight. When I've given talks similar to this, one of the first questions that the audience mouth might be, well, we can't do what Google does. Totally agreed. 10 years ago, Google couldn't do today what Google did now. Ditto for Netflix, ditto for Amazon. So there's no way that you're going to get all of this done immediately. I'm going to have about eight and a half minutes for questions. If you want to get in touch with me, here's how you do it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Any questions? <laughs> questions? Hey, Phil. What um, prevents companies from ado adopting cultures of uh, analytics? I'd argue it's people. I hate to be so glib about it, but this stuff matters. And true story, uh, an acquisitions editor, one of my publishers, once rejected my notion to split test covers and titles for my book. I wanted to call the book Too Big to Ignore the Business Case for Big Data. He didn't. He wanted to go with something else. I said, let's test it, right? Let's put up two versions of the book and see which one gets more clicks. He didn't want to do that because he felt like over 25 years, and he's a nice guy, he's a friend of mine, he had acquired a certain level of expertise. He didn't want to ask the question. Eric Ries did the same thing with his book, The Lean Startup, and he proved that one version of his cover and title received, I think it was 20% more clicks than another. Which is better? Probably the one that got more clicks, right? So we have to start by questioning assumptions and being way willing, like Google, to say, does this assumption about GPA and hiring still make sense across the board? If it doesn't, act on it. 
and they're tough, right? It's tough to question your, your knowledge, right? What do you know? Well, watch, uh, anyone ever see Moneyball, Billy Bean, the movie, yeah, you read the great. book, right? Billy Bean faced a tremendous amount of internal resistance from his own people. Well, he turned out to be right, right? Winning games, what, he won 100 games one year, 20 straight, made the playoffs with a budget that was a third of the Yankees. 60 million is a lot of money, but not when the Yankees are spending 175. Yeah. Say your company wanted to get more involved in analytics. Okay. Would you recommend hiring an analytics person or is there firms out there that you hire as a consultant to come in and say, okay, this is what I think you ought to be looking at? Sure, they can get you started and show you best practices. Uh, Google actually doesn't listen to management consultants, they listen to academics, right? So how can you instill that culture? Right? I mean, as someone who's worked as a consultant implementing new systems, I could tell you that I'd show people how to do things and they'd use their old system. So it, it helps to know what other companies are doing, but if the people aren't open to it, if they're not numerative, if they're not comfortable with data and technology, you can be the best consultant in the world, going back to Drucker, culture, eat strategy for breakfast. So it can't hurt, but I don't think it's either necessary nor sufficient. When I think about companies that have hired chief data officers, everyone acts like it's an elixir, it's a panacea. Go on LinkedIn, search for chief data officer at some of the companies I mentioned. They don't employ one, why? Because they understand that data is cultural and appointing someone with a title might sound important, but if the people underneath that person aren't actually doing anything, what's the point? Other questions? Yeah. Um, what websites or technologies do you like to use? Tableau is great, uh, D3 is very powerful. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I was part of a vendor demonstration and from someone's first question was, can we get it into Excel? I'd have a lot of nickels. There's nothing wrong with Excel, but it can't do everything. People use it as a Swiss army knife. I'm amazed at ASU at the times that my students will actually come up to me and say, hey, have you heard about this site? Uh, to visualize information or understand it. And people think that it's very expensive. In some cases, it's true. Other cases are open source uh, tools like Orange for the Mac, which lets you do decision trees. We also work with SAS Enterprise Miner. Again, I'm a big fan of Tableau because you don't have to be all that technical to use it. If you're a statistician and you need to throw data into SPSS or Stata or one of the advanced statistical tools, go for it. But most, people's, most people aren't data scientists. They, they are not statistician. Most people are everyday business users. So they want a way of interacting with the data. But yeah, there are so many tools out there I can't even keep track. And in, in terms of finding the best one, I have no idea. But D3 is really powerful. Uh, Tableau is a really useful one. Um, but I think it just starts with the idea that there may be something else out there other than a way of creating static pie charts or bar charts. Other questions? Got about four minutes left. Yeah, this would be the last question, if anyone has one. Uh, ultima pregunta. Yes. No questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. is there another one? Okay. Well, thank you again, Phil. Thanks. That was a really interesting.